Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Xiaomi. I'm a research scientist here in the quantum hardware team at Santa Barbara. Uh, today, I'll be talking about a recent experiment we did studying Marana Atmos, our quantum processors. Uh, this result is a hard work of the entire team, but also in particular, I would like to thank a few people from our team and also our collaborators, in particular, Michael Murphy have done a lot of numerical work on this uh, subject, and Dima and Pedro and Vadim have been leading much of the effort uh, as well. Uh, and this result has been posted in our archive for a couple of months, and we encourage everyone to check it out after the talk. Um, before we, delve in, before we delve into the details, uh, I would like to highlight a particular direction where uh, the experimental, uh, experimentalist in the next next team of our, uh, uh, you know, in our team are moving toward, and that field is the study of many body physics with quantum processors. Uh, this is in some sense encouraged by our result uh, pre presenting in last year's meeting where we. Um, we studied uh, this particular phenomenon called quantum information scrambling with different classes of quantum circuits. One thing we found is that for quantum circuits or quantum dynamics that generates entanglement and, and very fast, you know, this, uh, this so-called chaotic circuits, um, even in this, uh, in this circuits, certain local observables like this thing called out-of-time order correlators, um, they can be uh, simulated to in a fairly high accuracy on our quantum processors to the extent that they already kind of require a non-trivial level of classical resources to simulate. Um, so this is in some sense a first step toward uh, eventually achieving practical advantage in, 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 uh, in many body physics. But the topic of today is actually to, try to ask the, the, the other question, you know, can we slow down the spread of chaos in a many body quantum system? Um, here, the, you might first ask, you know, why would you bother to do that? Um, well, the answer lies in the fact that, um, you, uh, you know, that once you slow down the chaos, and, and uh, oftentimes what forms in quantum system is, is a different phases of matter, right? And as we all know, that quantum phases of matter have a lot of practical interest in the community. Um, you know, for one, they have a lot of applications. Uh, there are things like topological phases, which are actually re relevant to what we're going to talk about today. Um, and then there are other things like uh, non-Fermi liquid behavior or so-called strain metals and black holes. All these are different phases of matter uh, that people are interested in. And the other reason is that uh, oftentimes um, to realize this or, or simulate these phases of matter, all you need to do is to take an IC model or some sort of spin model um, and try to explore its you know, control parameters. And it turns out these models are readily implementable on our quantum computer. And third reason is that um, for all quantum phase of matter, there's always some sort of phase transition where it, it transits into a disordered or a chaotic phase. And, it, and often in between the order phase and the chaotic regime, there is a critical region where the computational complexity of the problem rises. And within this kind of region, there's a chance for us to, to sort of uh, achieve practical quantum at the computational advantage. So it really takes different boxes in here. Um, well, so uh, in this, toward this uh, uh, direction, there are maybe three works uh, over the last year or two that our group has uh, published. Uh, one is on the left is where we realized the ground state of Tori code. And right in the middle, where we studied uh, a form of dynamical many-body localization or, or, or you know, so-called discrete time crystals. On the very right, which is the subject of the, today's talk, is the study of Marana Atmos. So these, are all, uh, these all represent different phases of matter. Um, and they all have their different sort of applications and, and interest in community. So, um, what is Marana Atmos and why is it of interest to us? Well, um, as most of you know, probably, a lot of the interest in Marana type of physics is motivated by the, the, the question, you know, can you encode a qubit into the degenerate ground states of many body system, right? So, um, and the, you know, this, this type of uh, qubit encoding or topological quantum computing typically has the following sort of picture where you have a many-body system with many le uh, energy levels, 
and there are maybe two or, or more degenerate many-body ground states imposed by the symmetry of problem that are separated by the rest of the levels uh, through an energy gap. And in a, in a very simple picture, if the temperature of the system is low enough, then several transition between the ground states and the rest of the, the levels are forbidden. Therefore, these states are, have a very long lifetime or a very long T1. And if you manage to be able to do some sort of gaze or, or operation between these this qubits, um, then you, you, you have a topological qubit. And that's protected from both T1 and in some sense also defacing because they, are, they have the same energy. Um, a, a very pr prototypical example of topological quantum system is this uh, is the so-called Kitab chain, which you can realize with nanowires. There you have sort of uh, two operators, uh, so-called Marana edge operators, chi left and chi, chi right. Uh, these things, they, they're kind of like combination of fermions, but they're locally separated. And you can define essentially poly raising or lowering operators for the qubit using these Marana operators. And because they are spatially separated, uh, local noise cannot perturb uh, the global state of the system. Therefore, um, you have a qubit that's you know, nominally insensitive to local noise. And it is because of this characteristic, um, there has been a, a really intense experimental search for, for these things in, in, in different material platforms. One example is semiconductor nanowires, uh, where you would try to try to uh, proximatize a, a piece of semiconductor nanowires with, with a superconducting material like aluminum or something, and then um, and try to see if you can you can realize um, this Kitab chain. But the problem with these uh, platforms is that the the capability is quite limited. And, you know, typically the way people search for these edge modes is by measuring current where you see a, a so-called zero bias peak. Um, but here, um, because of the, the dirtiness, the, the low mo mobility of these uh, you know, essentially transistors, uh, there can be a lot of, of um, you know, uh, states, localized states in the system that are actually not Marana edge modes, but they can be misidentified. Um, so the question to ask is, you know, can, we, can we do this with a quantum computer? Can you realize or, or simulate these things with a quantum processor? And of course, the huge advantage of a quantum processor is that we know exactly the, the dynamics we, we do. So there's no question about what the Hamiltonian is. But you do kind of have to pay a couple of prices. Right? So for one, um, these operators are uh, you know, fermionic operators. And our qubits behave like spin one half particles. So basically, to realize the Kitab chain Hamiltonian, you have to do a so-called Jordan-Wigner transformation to take these uh, fermionic operators into a bunch of poly spin operators. And this transformation is actually non-local. So one of the edge operators, the Marana edge operators, becomes a non-local poly, uh, poly operator. So, uh, there's, uh, so basically, this transformation destroys, in some sense, the original topological protection that's, that's offered in a fermionic system. So that's one price you have to pay. And the other price you have to kind of pay is that our system, the ground state of our quantum system is basically all zero, right? And that is not necessarily the ground state of the, the quantum circuit we typically run. And especially uh, for us, because we do everything with gaze, you really have to trotterize an evolution. And that basically means that uh, the, the system you are driving is really a floquet system, a periodic system, where the, the eigenstates really lie on a circle. Um, here, what happens is that um, things still decay versus, uh, you know, with qubit T1. Right? Energy relaxation is always going to happen because the ground states you're trying to realize is not really the ground state of the natural system you're dealing with. So basically, T1 is going to be an issue here. But nevertheless, with these challenges ahead, uh, you know, in mind, we still march ahead and, and try to see what ha what really happens uh, when you, when you try to realize uh, these modes in our system. So here is the experimental data where we um, took um, this this quantum circuit shown in the previous slide, uh, which basically realized as a form of a kicked IC model. So you have a, a layer of transvol uh, transverse of, of X pulses followed by a layer of ZZ interactions followed by a layer of uh, local Z field, right? So this is basically a kicked icing model. Um, and you basically run this on a quantum processor. Here we use 47 qubits, 
and then you measure local observable sigma z out of it. And you immediately actually see something quite striking. So uh, on top of the, this, this plot is a 2D map of local polarization, you know, z as a function of space, you know, the, the horizontal axis and the vertical axis is, is uh, sorry, as a function of space, which is the vertical axis, and the function of time, which is horizontal axis. So you see qubits in the middle, they pretty much decay after 10 or 20 cycles. Everything goes green, meaning zero here. Whereas on the edges, you see that there's up, down, and this so-called subhomotic response, which lives for a very long time, up to 300 cycles, and it's still kind of ongoing. And the two plots at the bottom are selective, uh, uh, selective, uh, selective cuts through the, through, the, through the data, where you really see the contrast between the qubits on the edge and qubits within the bulk. And even more strikingly, here we actually uh, made you know, a lot of, uh, we actually added a lot of local Z field um, this so-called H field into the system, this actually breaks the integrability of the quantum circuit. So even with the integrability of the quantum circuit broken and with all this T1, T2 noise uh, processes, we see this very long-lived edge, edge observables. In fact, they decay almost like the T1 of a single qubit. So this, this alone is quite striking. But to, so to, in, order to, in order to understand why this is so long-lived, we turn to the case where um, integrability is not broken. Here, you can really characterize the single particle energy bands of the system very uh, accurately. So the way to do that is you turn the local field h to 0, and then you measure the local observables as a function of time for, um, on the edge, and then you do a Fourier transform. And there, you can then you see a, a bunch of peaks, um, and these peaks basically correspond to uh, the single particle energy of the, system, of the integrable system. Uh, and typically, you have a lot of uh, sort of uh, low peaks that correspond to the bulk modes, and two tall peaks corresponding to the edge modes. And then you can map them out uh, as a function of the control parameter g. Uh, so basically, when g equals to 0 0.5, the system is in a critical regime where, um, um, where uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, there's no topological phase. And when g is bigger than 0 0.5, there's supposed to be a topological phase where Marana edge modes exist. And the data on the right, the three uh, color plots, basically show the energy bands um, for th the three you know, length of the, the, y, uh, the 1D chain, going from six qubits all the way to 18 qubits. Here you see that um, as a function of G, there is a, a gap opening between the two, uh, the, the bright band in the middle, which is at Marana edge modes, and the rest of the bulk energy bands, right? And it is this gap that really protects us from sort of leakage or T1 decay. Because um, you know, it, it, even though integrity is broken, the large energy gap ensures that any any sort of uh, thermalization process happen, it still happens at a very low slow, slow, uh, at, at a very slow scale, the so-called pre-thermalization. But then you, you also realize from the energy band, there's another issue, uh, namely that for short chains like the six qubit chain, the moral energies are not completely degenerate. You see, there's a small splitting to delta uh, divided by pi which separates the energy of the two Marana edge modes. And this little separation is sensitive to uh, changes in the control parameter G and may actually induce defacing. Uh, but to see how this can be suppressed, we actually systematically mapped out the energy splitting of the two Marana edge modes as a function of uh, qubit chain length, right? So on the left is some example data where you're looking at the, the, the energy difference of the two Marana edge modes. As a, for different chain lengths. You can see that if you increase the length of the chain, this, this gap, this difference rapidly closes. On the right, it's basically showing uh, the, the energy splitting for different values of G and for different values of uh, the chain length. And you see that there's a, essentially an exponential suppression of the, the, uh, the energy splitting or hybridization, hybridization between the Marana and edge modes. And this begs the question, you know, in a regime where this splitting is highly suppressed, do we, can we demonstrate some sort of low-frequency noise resilience for these edge modes? Because there, the quasi-energy will be rigidly locked to pi, and supposedly uh, fluctuation in the environment is not able to perturb it away from that stable value. And that's indeed, uh, and to even make that point more clear, we experimentally uh, realized another sort of edge mode, which, is, which does not have symmetry and is not protected by the same sort of Marana physics. And this is done by essentially doing a, a, a trotterized version of the XY model uh, and, and with local field Z, 
right? So it turns out the quasi energy of this system can be tuned into certain spots where if you look at the observables on edge, they oscillate you know, much like the Maharana edge modes. And they have a quasi energy peak at pi, similar to Maharana, uh, same as the Maharana edge modes. Um, but it, but if you read, uh, but if you repeat the process of quasi energy spectroscopy, like we we're just done for this system, you realize that uh, instead of ha you know, although the system does have also the the bulk energy uh, gap, like we we're seeing here, there's a bright band in the middle and it's separated from all these little bands on the edges. Although there's a bulk gap, the um, there's nowhere on this control parameter space where the quasi energy of the X Y edge mode is insensitive, right? So everywhere this edge mode energy is sort of dependent on, on the control parameter. And that means that um, you know, any fluctuation in the control parameter might lead to defacing of the edge mode in this case. Now we go and try to do an, exam, uh, an exp uh, experiment to compare the behavior of the two different edge modes uh, in terms of the response to low frequency noise. And here it is done by doing uh, essentially a disorder averaging experiment where we uh, uh, we uh, we change the random z field, and we create an ensemble of quantum circuits, measure their observables, and average them out. Uh, this sort of mimics the the effect of quasi-static noise. And after this uh, process of disorder averaging, you see that the response of each one of the attributes is dramatically different. So on the left. I'm showing the the um, the the result for the X Y you know edge mode. Here you see that any perturbation on top, if you focus on the top panel, any changes, tiny changes in the local field, uh, creates beating in the in the response, and it's sort of sensitive dependent on on the specific on the specifics of the disorder. And if you average them out, then as you crank up the disorder stretch delta, everything decays out very quickly. Whereas on the right, in the middle column, you see that the Marana, uh, the Marana edge modes, the UF edge modes, they're pretty much insensitive to whatever disorder pattern I put into the system, and they do not change upon disorder averaging. Um, now, the last thing I want to really highlight is that there's a really striking observation where if you go and probe uh, not just the, the, Z, the, the local Z observables, but Higher poly terms, right? So you see, there are a family of eight essentially poly, multi qubit poly operators, which are all kind of part of the, the Jordan Wigner transformation of the Marana edge mode. If you go and probe all of that, you see that the, the late time behavior of these things, they have a, they're characterized by a single uniform decay rate. Um, so on the top are basically the, the, ob uh, the observables of, for each one of these operators. Um, and at the bottom, I'm taking the absolute value of them and plot them on log scale for late time behavior. You see the lines are basically parallel, meaning all of these operators decay at exactly the same rate. And this is highly non-intuitive because these operators, they have different number of qubits in them. And naively, you would expect you know, the, the decay rate to scale as a function of you know, the size of the operator. But here, it's not really doing that. And this, you can really exploit to reconstruct the accurately reconstruct the integral motion here being the Marana operator. Uh, so basically, you would you would take the ratio of all of these operators and renormalize it according to their norm, and sort of look at the spatial oscillation of the Marana edge modes uh, as they reach into the bulk. And that data is shown on the right. And at the very bottom, I'm comparing the this you know Marana wave function we extracted from the experiment with the actual one that we calculated. You see, over almost three orders of magnitude. The coefficients of these terms agree to really striking accuracy, and this is quite nice because there, there's essentially a building error mitigation strategy here that you can um, you can infer the the ideal behavior of these uh, conserved quantities without having to to do any reference experiment. Okay, so let me conclude by saying two important things that we learned not just from this experiment but also uh, with the related experiment on time crystals. You know, one thing is that error mitigation is really powerful in the era of, 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 uh, of NISC. So there are strategies, you know, like what, what I just described, you know, how to, re uh, how to reconstruct integrals of motion, or this many-body echo uh, protocol we exploited in OTOC or the uh, DTC experiments. These allow you to actually infer the ideal behavior of the system to great accuracy up to quite, quite a bit of uh, time evolution without needing, let's say, full error correction. So this is very useful.
And the other thing we discovered is that even in a, in a quantum system that looks like it's fully interacting and sort of th supposed to thermalize very quickly, there are certain things like the, you know, the, uh, there are certain modes or, or degree of freedom that are actually protected from that, that, that thermalization process. You know, in the, in the case of time crystal, we found MBL to be the key for protecting these degrees of freedom. And in the case of Marana physics, we find that symmetry protection is a key for, for preserving the, these uh, qualities. And there's hope that we can explore someday these sort of conserved qualities to help us build you know, inherently protected type of quantum computers. But of course, that's sort of an extension from what we have now and remains to be seen uh, how successful they will eventually prove to be. And with that, I thank you for your attention. <laughs>